to grow a business, there needs to be a revolution. In other words, evolution can only happen with a revolution. And the first revolution is a crisis of control. And that's why my talk tonight was called Give Up Control. Because as an entrepreneur and as a serial entrepreneur, growing a business, the first major crisis you face, besides other things like cash flow, minor little details like that, the first major hurdle you face is that of control, of understanding your locus of control. So it came to one of my principles, or what I call the tips and traps from the trenches, to never ask, never ask staff to do anything you wouldn't do. Now, that, it sounds trivial. Okay, so it's about, it's about how you demonstrate to the staff. We had no staff, it was myself and my partner. WordPerfect 5.1, we typed everything up, we printed the master copies on an inkjet printer. Stood at the photocopier, photocopied the notes, and then went and lectured and handed those same notes out. When we started employing staff, by the time we got to 4,000 students over the six campuses, we had 160 academic staff plus our admin staff. But we knew, my partner and I, that we could lecture every single course. We didn't. And we never held it over anyone's head. But it helped the staff to understand that we understood what they were doing. The question is, if you're a control freak, how do you give up control? So let's look at some ideas of how you give up control. What did I do in my businesses? And that's the second principle in the title of my book. How do I give up control to gain control? What did I give up control of? And what did I gain control of? Currently, I have seven brokers and four PAs. And yet our turnover is six or seven times higher than it was when I had 18 brokers. Because we empowered our PAs. We empowered our staff. They're not called PAs. They're called finance officers or finance managers. And we empower them to talk to clients. We empower them to email the clients. We empower them to do all of that. And what's it done for me? It's given me control of my time. Given my brokers control of their time to do the revenue generation stuff and not the day-to-day -day grind. That's what giving up control is about. What's interesting is how many companies do you know that put out their, their vision and their mission that says our first priority is our customer? No, it isn't. Yes, it is because you do need customers otherwise your business goes belly up. But the reality is, without your team, without your people, you're nothing. I have an open door policy. Now, how many bosses have said they have an open door policy? Okay. All right. The fact is, in my office, my door of my office is only ever closed twice. For two reasons. One is if I'm interviewing a client because of confidentiality. And one is when I'm doing staff appraisals. Everything else in the office is spoken about with open doors. It's hard. How do you manage a team where somebody wants to complain about someone else? We've created a culture of open doors where we say, right, you want to complain about them, I want you to complain. Obviously, you know, staff do have a legitimate complaint. They come to me quietly and talk about it. But in the main, it's something that can be resolved by sitting around a table and talking about it. In our education businesses, in the mortgage businesses, we've always had a relaxed office environment. Even when I was in venture capital, the first day I joined the fund in Australia, the accountant in the business, who never saw a person in his life, except the other staff, was sitting there at his desk in a jacket and tie. And I walked in, I said to the boss, I'm not seeing anyone today, my jacket and my tie are going behind my door, and I'd prefer not to wear a tie. Within three months, the boss wasn't wearing a tie either. And I only have three rules. I mean, in the mortgage industry, we're dealing with people's lives. It's the most important financial decision people are making. In the education business, it was about educating their children. It was one of the most important decisions they were making there. When I have to make a call to a client, and this is an educational thing, when I have to phone a client and say, sorry, your loan has been declined, it's a sad day. I don't get paid if a loan's declined. It's very sad. 
but it's also sad for the client. So two things I try and teach my staff. The first is find an alternative solution. Call the client and say, by the way, this bank over here, the big yellow bank or whatever you want to call it, has declined your loan, but we've got an alternative solution over here. Could you define your culture in 25 words or less? I'm talking about your corporate culture now. And get down to the core of what it means. And coming out of that is do you know what your staff think of you? Marketing doesn't have to be this big, bold thing. Marketing can be simple. It can be guerrilla advertising. There are no businesses today, unless you're Tesla, I guess, that are really going to have uncontested market space, and I don't think that's going to be uncontested for that long. The biggest customer complaint, and I've read numerous surveys, is lack of communication. Every client in the mortgage business gets a call or an email twice a week at least. Not clients who settled six months ago. I'm talking about in the middle of a transaction when they're nervous, they want to know are they going to get the house, are they going to get the investment property, are they going to get the Lamborghini because we do that kind of finance as well. The client feels warm and fuzzy. They've been communicated with. They know their interests are being looked after. If you're making mistakes, then you're making new things, trying new things. Learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself and changing your world. You're doing things you've never done before, but more importantly, you're doing something and you're discovering what you're made of. I haven't always built the biggest businesses and they haven't always been the best and they haven't always had the best processes and procedures, but we've had fun. We've had fun building them, I've had fun staff and we've had a fun time. And so, that's what I do now. I still run the mortgage business. I still see clients and I still talk about property and finance. But at the end of the day, my passion is giving people's business the edge. And that's what I do now. In your development of your business, you always referred fondly to your partners. Yeah. How did you choose your partners and, and was it to complement your shortages in some way? Yeah, so in, in the education business, my partner was a guy, Jonathan Feldman. John and I had met doing a course when we were 15, uh, we became, we were real nerds. We did our ha radio ham licenses. Now, talk to people today, they were, what's that? Okay, we did these things called radio licenses where we had these crackly sounds and spoke to people in weird places in the world. Something like chat rooms on the internet, but a whole lot safer. Okay, um, and we met and we just hit it off. And we found out, well, we discovered that my technical skills, um, being, you know, enge engineering based, thinking, mathematics, we both had MBAs, he did his at Stellenbosch. Um, um, but we had decided years before that we'd do business together. His specialist area, he had a BCom in marketing and I was obviously the technical engineering guy, which is kind of turnaround because he now lives in Perth and runs a coding academy, which is kind of what I did one, <laughs> one master's in, which was, um, you know, coding. And um, he's now involved in technology and I'm in the soft skills of leadership. So it, it's interesting. So how do we, um, yeah, absolutely. It was about, and sometimes you're wrong and sometimes you do get it wrong. So my very first partner in the mortgage business was an Australian guy who had played cricket professionally in the UK for a couple of years, had been state manager of a brewery, which sounds like a good contact to have. But his main contact was that he got us lots of clients because he'd spent lots of time talking to people. And so we broke up after about two years when we found out that his idea of balancing a checkbook was something like that and had no financial skills whatsoever. And we'd got the business to a point where I needed someone else who was financially astute and not just a great marketer. Whereas in my education business and in the, after my next, my partner Jonathan from the education business, moved to Australia and he invested in our businesses, got his permanent residence and decided he didn't want to be in the mortgage business anymore, which was fine. But we worked together and grew the business for about five years. But we had these complementary skills. And um, now it's really on my head. Do you have five minutes after this session? Sure. I mean, I'll, we'll get thrown out at some point because I'm sure the WBS staff want to go home. Um, what is interesting, and for those who, who students, you know, or past students here, when I walked around, I only recognized one lecture room. And I even pointed out this chair that I sat in when I did my MBA. 
And on the one side of me was a, a very good friend who now lives in Atlanta called Michelle Panos, and another friend who I've lost contact with somewhere in Johannesburg called Tolly and Gwenya. And um, the three of us sat in the three chairs in the back row, I must add, for our entire MBA. So it was interesting um, walking around the school and seeing how it's grown since then. Okay, yes, there was a mic somewhere up there. You don't have to feel obligated to ask questions, you know. At least everyone's awake, so it's a good start. Hi, Ray. Um, something that's uh, quite a dilemma in our business is um, if you're wanting to create an informal culture and, um, in a way, be friends with, with your colleagues and building this business together, how do you balance holding people accountable with also being able to give them the freedom and pleasure their strengths and, and maybe okay. be a little bit maverick but still maintain a sense of quality and value to your customers? Okay, so it, it was interesting because one of my colleagues doing this leadership course that we're developing um, was a superintendent of the police force, which is basically one level below deputy commissioner, which is sort of the third highest level you could get to in the police. And we've had a, a long discussion about that in, a, in an organization as structured as the police, how you create those cultures within your teams and things like that. And yes, it is hard because in certain environments such as police, and I was talking, you know, um, on the flight over here, I was talking to one of the crew on the flight just because it was middle of the night and I didn't feel like sleeping and got talking to one of the crew. And she just asked me what I was doing and I said, I was doing this talk and this is what I do for a living. And she said, well, that's interesting because what we do on the planes is very different to what Qantas management think we do. Okay. And I said to her, but if there's an emergency, you guys are going to switch out of your happy mode into following the rule book play for play. And so that's what it's about. It is about, you know, things that I didn't even, you know, I, I mentioned sort of communication and the truth and, and that kind of stuff. So we have some unwritten ground rules in the organization and that's, I have a very good friend, in fact, I don't know if anyone's come across a guy, uh, I have a very good friend in Australia, the name is Steve Simpson, but he has a partner here in South Africa called Steph Duplessis. And they talk about UGRs, unwritten ground rules. And it's those unwritten ground rules in the organization that define the standards of behavior. And sometimes you have to shift those unwritten ground rules. And so everything else that happens around it, as long as the ground rules are there, they're not set by management. They set with the team that they know their boundaries. And so, yes, it is the dilemma. Uh, but, and and there, is a, there, is a, there is a point at which you do stop. You know, you are the boss. Okay, you are the boss and you have to stamp your feet and throw a little tantrum when they do the wrong thing. Um, I never, my staff have only heard me scream once. Okay, and that was actually at a bank employee, not at my staff. But they don't ever want to see that again. They never want to see the sheer anger that I displayed because this person was just insulted me and insulted my team and I lost the plot with them. But my staff know that there are boundaries. Okay, so for instance, you know, they won't drink more than two beers. That's the rule. It's not written anywhere. I don't really want to be sued when someone does do that. But it's an unwritten rule of the organization. There's another... I've lost track of the hands, but they all went up at the same time. But we'll start here because you were waving for the microphone. Thank you. Um, what are the lessons that you have learned in the businesses that were not successful that you see entrepreneurs repeating today? Okay, what are not successful? So, I mean, interestingly, I, I found that there's, and you still get many SEO, I use that in the current environment. I get, I got, we got, you know, convinced to go SEO, Google AdWords, all that kind of stuff that we were doing. And it was a complete not a waste of time, but it got too expensive, as an example, in, in, in one of our businesses to do that. So was it a failure? It wasn't necessarily a failure. We probably did it the wrong way, more than a pure business failure. The biggest, the biggest failures I've seen is a particular organization that we deal with, um, which is a sales organization for property. And uh, how, how do I describe it? The, 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 the founder of the organization is a really nice guy. He's just turned 70. 
But in his contracts with his team, who are all subcontractors, he builds in something called founder's rules. And founder's rules are, I'm the founder, I can change the rules whenever I feel like it. Okay? Now, I've tried to talk to him because we have a great relationship and he calls me for advice. And I've said to him, you can't invoke founder's rules. And he says, why? I can. It's my privilege. That, I don't reckon that organization will be around in 12 months' time. Because a lot of the guys in the network have gone, you know, he sets a goal post over here. And everyone goes, great, we know where to aim. And suddenly the goal post moved to over here. And just as they're adjusting their aim, the goal post's over here. Okay? And so, you know, part of what teams want, part of a team culture, you can have a team that moves, but has to move together. And this particular organization is horribly dysfunctional at the moment. There's distrust. There is, and the worst thing he ever did was hire a corporate lawyer. Sorry, any corporate lawyers here? Um, because everything, every decision he made was referred to the lawyer who would go, well, it could be this or it could be that. Okay? And so it's been an interesting experience from seeing a company that at its peak sold 2,500 properties a year has sold 300 in the last 12 months because of the dysfunctional environment. And it's a lot to do with the culture. It's got a lot to do with the founder. It's got a lot to do with that he put a CEO in place who had a hidden agenda. He didn't go out. And that's an interesting one about culture, is he took somebody who'd come up through the ranks and made them CEO. But the way the structure was, he would have been better off finding an external CEO to come in with a clean slate. And so sometimes changing a corporate culture needs the major shareholders to make those hard decisions, to chop, to bring in a new CEO from outside. Uber have just done it. Everyone seen that? Okay. I mean, the Uber culture was pretty much non-politically correct would be the simplest way of describing it. But what did they do? They brought in an external CEO. They had to. They had to change the ship's direction. Okay, I will answer some questions privately afterwards for those who have questions. Um, I thank you for your time. I hope it's been entertaining. I hope the stories have made some level of sense to you. If anyone does want to contact me, please grab a card. Um, do take the cloths because I really don't want to take them back home with me. Um, and there are some, some pamphlets here on the other topics on I which I talk. I think let's give a round of applause, guys.